To the first day, I'd like to welcome you all to our first in the series of the HYB webinars. Um, we've been very fortunate that the Youngstock team at NWF have given up their evening to provide us with what I know will be a really interesting presentation and will provide us all with some take home messages to help us improve our young stock management. So I'm gonna pass over to Abby and Beth who will lead the evening um, and they'll tell you more about how to submit questions um, and everything like that. So I'll, I'll go and meet now. Brilliant, thanks Lizzie. Um, hi everyone, I'm Abby England, a technical manager and I also look after the Youngstock team at NWF and Beth, who's also on the call and going to chair the questions for us at the end, um, is also on the technical team and the Youngstock team as well at NWF. So just to get started, as you've all logged in, Beth's muted you, that's just to stop um, any interference, but if at any point you've got an urgent question that you want to ask, um, please just unmute yourself and stop me. Alternatively, at the bottom, there's a little chat button um, which you can send a direct message to Beth with a question and we can cover all of those at the end or I can um, reply directly to you at a later point or to Lizzie. So today um, I'm going to talk about car signals, discussing the five critical control points. Normally we do this as a split session on farm and then we'd um, go into a room and do a bit more of a classroom session on it. But unfortunately, um, with COVID, this has all had to be online. But hopefully maybe at a later point um, further into the winter, we can do some regional on farm meetings as well. Um, so as I say, the first part of the presentation is going to be car signals using the five critical control points, looking at how they can influence the future productivity mm -hmm. and longevity of heifers joining your herd, but ultimately the future profitability of them and your farm business. And then I'm going to go on to highlight some of the points on different milk replacers and their ingredients they may or may not con contain and include. And then finally, any tools which you can use at home on your farms and um, to set goals and targets. So what are the five C's of calf rearing? The first one's colostrum. The second one is calories. Unfortunately, energy didn't really fit, so we had to go with calories. Um, third one's comfort. Fourth is cleanliness. And the last one is consistency. So starting with colostrum, calves aren't born with an acquired immunity. Um, it can't pass through the bovine placenta and a calf's natural immunity, or as we're seeing here on this graph, the acquired immunity, which is the green line, doesn't start to kick in until at least three weeks of age. But you can see it's much further on than that. We're looking at roughly seven weeks before they've got a suitable level of their own active immunity. So until then, we are the calves are reliant on passive immunity, which is from colostrum and from the antibodies the colostrum provides. So that's why um, colostrum is so important. Other benefits, not just antibodies, um, it's got hormones, growth factors, and is rich in energy density as well. And factors to consider um, when you're looking at providing colostrum, the first one is timing. So you want it within the first six hours, but ideally more between the two and four hour uh, gap. And the reason for this, um, sorry, this graph is a little bit small, but hopefully um, it gets the message across. By six hours, you've already lost 10% ability of the absorption of those antibodies. And um, so that's why we are uh, pushing people to do that earlier if possible. And the reason why you lose absorption over time essentially is because in the epithelial cells in the lining of the gut, when a calf's born, they've got tiny gaps in them, which allow the antibodies to be able to be absorbed that's provided through the colostrum. But as soon as the calf's born, those gaps start to mature and get smaller, which makes it more difficult for the antibodies to be absorbed. And you can see here by roughly 20 hours, it's virtually non-existent. And so that's why it's so important to provide it so quickly. In terms of how you provide it, the, the, in the past, there's been a lot of chatter between should we tube colostrum? Should we let them uh, drink it from a bottle? And there has been research now on that. And as long as the, the tube and the equipment you're using is sterile, there is no negative effect with tubing colostrum 
over um, feeding it through a bottle in terms of anti uh, antibody absorption. So secondly, we're looking at quantity and we'd like 10% of body weight. So for a 40 kilo calf, that's four liters. But most importantly, the quality of that we also want to look at. So we're looking for at least 50 grams of IgG per liter with a daily requirement or a first daily requirement of at least 200 grams. Now to get this um, quality, obviously you're going to have to use something to measure it. We would prefer um, you to use a refractometer, which is this um, in the image here. Um, it's relatively easy to use once you've used it a couple of times. Um, they're only about £15 off Amazon. And as long as you're getting a refractometer with the brick scale, um, you can't go far wrong. So you, it just requires a couple of drops of um, clean water to then calibrate it. You dry it off and then put your couple of drops of colostrum on, hold it up to a natural light source, and it tells you what the um, percentage of your colostrum is. Other things you can use, colostrometers, um, which again can be a good tool, but you have got to be careful of temperature of the colostrum that you're using because it can give you a fake high or low reading. And another option, which is becoming a little bit more common, these have come over from uh, Europe, from the Netherlands. They're called colostrobals. And essentially what you do with those is just throw them in the bucket with a freshly harvest colostrum. It works on density. And basically, the more that float, the higher quality colostrum you've got. And then finally, um, cleanliness. So we want a clean carving pen and equipment because the first thing that crosses that gut lining that I was talking about before accelerates those gaps to close down. So we don't want bacterial pathogens potentially lowering the absorption of the antibodies even further. And of course, with no immunity, calves are at a, a high risk of getting sick from any bacterial pathogens that may, they may ingest in the first few days of life. So how do you know if your colostrum protocol is working correctly? You can actually test for passive transfer. So if you work closely with your vet, um, they can come on farm and take blood samples of calves between one and seven days of age. And then they analyze those for blood serum um, for IgG, grams per liter content, or equivalent serum protein levels. And the minimum levels um, we're looking for is at least 90% uh, of animals to be over 10 grams per liter of IgG if using, uh, sorry, 10 grams uh, per liter of IgG. And if you're using serum protein levels at 5.1. Now in the UK, we'd probably be quite happy with a region of between 5.6 and 5.8, which is between the fair and good. Um, is that good enough? Should we be striving for more? The US certainly thinks so. Their new targets now are for at least 40% of animals to be in this excellent or above um, reading. So you might be sitting there, sitting there thinking, that's great, I can give them lots of colostrum, but what benefit is there to the calf if I do that? And um, so there's been a lot of research that shows a reduced treatment and mortality rates. So SRUC did some nice work that showed calves were 2.5 times more like, but less likely to die in the first two months of age if they had full, partial, uh, full passive transfer compared to partial tr passive transfer. And then Fabra et al also did some nice work. So they looked at um, the difference in feeding two liters of colostrum to four liters of colostrum. And they found that they had improved daily live weight gain, decreased age at first calving, and 11% higher survival rate through into the second lactation. And not only that, also increased first and second lactation milk yield. So up to 1,000 litres per lactation, which at a 28p pence per litre price, you're looking at £280 per lactation per cow, which is obviously... Um, starts to add up. So how can we influence our colostrum quality or can we even influence colostrum quality? There are a few things that you can do at home. The first would be dry cow vaccinations. So looking at which ones you perhaps want to provide, but also when um, to provide those to ensure that the antibodies are then produced and passed over in the colostrum. 
So definitely speak to your vets and work closely with your vets in terms of that side. Another thing you can look at is your dry cow ration. Um, so we've seen positive improvements in quality and yield when both rumen and bypass starch and protein sources are balanced, and um, particularly in the close to ration. The length of the dry cow period, so short dry cow periods, typically less than six weeks, can often lead to increased metabolic diseases in the cow, but also lower, lower quality um, and yields of colostrum as well. We want to minimise stress, so whether that's overcrowding, um, potential heat stress, not enough feed space, things like that. We just want to make it um, a stress-free environment as possible. Milking the cow soon after calving. So as soon as a cow calves, she starts to let down her milk. And the longer you leave it, the more diluted the colostrum and the antibodies become. So potentially you end up with needing to provide too much litres then maybe you can get into a calf in a day um, because you've left the cow too long to be milked. So ideally uh, within one to two hours, but certainly within four hours if possible. And not always, but on average, um, a lactation can influence it with heifers. So usually we would see heifers with a slightly lower colostrum quality than maybe a third or fourth lactation cow, for example. Not always, but just something to be aware of. In terms of your colostrum management with storing, um, ideally, you know, freezing, put it in a Ziploc bag so it's as flat as possible. And all that's doing is increasing the surface area so you get a quicker cooling and a quicker thawing when you then want to come to reuse that colostrum. You can cool and freeze it for up to one year. If you're not freezing, you need to rapidly cool it to stop the growth of bacteria and it can stay in a fridge for one day or 24 hours. If you are freezing it, do label it correctly. So with dam details, the date it's been harvested and the IgG content. The reason why it's important to put the dam details on there is if, for example, a couple of months down the line, that cow then becomes yonis positive, you need to go and fish out the colostrum of your um freezer store and throw that away because so we don't want to be feeding yonis positive um, colostrum to any cows any calves so defrosting and heating colostrum don't microwave or uh, to reheat and defrost it when you can in a water bath not above 60 degrees no hotter or you'll denature the antibodies so what we've talked about and trying to get passive, passive immunity to these calves that's all surrounding with the antibodies and if you're using water over 60 degrees or putting it in a microwave you're at a high risk of denaturing those to eventually uh, essentially be null and void um, for example a parlor boiler on average will be about 80 degrees so if you're getting your water to thaw out your colostrum straight from the parlor boiler you're potentially undoing all that good work that you've done by harvesting it prior to that. Can pasteurising colostrum be beneficial? Yes, it can. Um, on some units, it might be more beneficial than others. But when used correctly, it can be a good tool. So it can help reduce microbial loading, which can increase the absorption of your antibodies from your colostrum. It can kill mycoplasma but it does not kill yonis. Um, that's something that is maybe batted around a little bit, but it doesn't kill um, yonis. You want to do it for 60 minutes at 60 degrees and no higher for the same reason we just discussed about denaturing the antibodies within the colostrum. And there's a, quite a lot of different types of machines, but something like this, store and thaw, it can defrost and reheat colostrum ready for feeding in 15 to 20 minutes. So could be quite a handy tool for some units. The second C is calories. So all milk replacers tend to look the same, but they might not actually be the same quality. So calf, a calf's feed conversion ratio will never be as high uh, as in the first few weeks of age. So it's essential that we exploit that as much as we can. For example, a calf with 900 grams of powder and some pellets can easily do 800 grams of growth per day. 
if you compare that to maybe a beef cow, you'll be lucky if they're eating 10 kilos dry matter intake and giving you 1.5 kilos daily live weight gain. So these calves are so efficient and we just need to take advantage of that. We'll touch on some feeding guidelines later on and um, just to highlight that in a little bit more detail. So an example of epi epigenetics or exploiting the genetic potential is the queen bee analogy. So a queen and worker bees share the same genome. They're essentially genetic clones, but they're just fed differently. So from the larva stage, the queen is fed royal jelly and 10 times more of it than the workers. And from that, she gets double the growth rate a longer lifespan so she can survive for three years compared to a worker bee that's only two months and she's also um, able to reproduce so the queen lays up to 2,000 eggs per day and that's just a prime example of how early life nutrition in a different species can have major effects on their um, life. So calories in cold weather I think this is probably a very common um, thing most people know about this, that in cold weather, particularly below 10 degrees C, um, calves use energy, more energy to keep warm. Therefore, we would um, suggest that people feed a little bit more energy through more milk to keep them uh, growing at the same level. Nowadays, a lot of people will also use jackets. So if you've got a jacket on a, a calf in cold weather, they might not necessarily need and the extra milk. And when looking at this, we would always prefer that you feed an extra half a litre or litre rather than increasing the concentration. Um, if you increase the concentration too much, you can start to get the risk of nutritional scours. But something that's maybe overlooked a little bit more is calories in warm weather. So like when it's cold, and calves use energy to keep themselves warm. When it's warm, calves use extra energy to keep themselves cool. And actually it can be up to 20 to 30%. So um, it's a bit of a misconception that we can maybe drop milk in the summer. We've got a lot of information on our website if, that, if it's something that maybe you want to read in a little, more, a little bit more depth. But tips would be provide clean, fresh water and plenty of it uh, where you can improve the airflow. Don't drop or at worst remove milk and if need as I said there's more information on our website on that. The third C is cleanliness and um, so as mentioned with colostrum muck contains half harmful bacteria and um, so we want to keep clean hygiene protocols clean carving pens buckets and utensils should be clean in between feeding and if they're not clean between feeding the calf should keep the same bucket uh, similarly to robots or the milk feeding machines if you don't have hygiene stations on them we would recommend you change um, the teats a few times a day normally three times a day so a lot of our units would have three teats per pen you have one always dry clean and dry waiting to go on one in a bucket with disinfectant soaking and one on the machine Fresh water, forage, milk replacer and starter pellets should be given daily. So in the first few weeks of life, they won't take much forage or starter pellets, but it still should be on offer for them to sniff at, chew if they want, spit back out. They don't need to be given much, but they should be given the option. And where possible, house calves away from animal, adult animals so they're not in the same airspace and always work youngest to oldest. Comfort. Calves can spend 17 to 19 hours laying down a day. Um, and normally they'll do that with their nose and head in the straw. So we don't really want them breathing in ammonia from the bedding for all that time. They're more susceptible to respiratory diseases anyway. So bedding should be dry and clean um, and they should have adequate space, airspace and ventilation. There's a couple of um, checks that you can do in the shed to see what your comfort levels are like. The first one is the drop knee test. So this is something if we were on a practical session, um, we do in person, but hopefully you can imagine what I'm trying to tell you to do. Um, so you drop down to your knees and you stay there for one minute. And when you stand up, you should still be dry and clean. And you can also look at nesting scores. So again, a bit more prevalent in winter, 
but we're looking for a nesting score of three, which is all of the legs covered by the straw, well bedded. Two would only be some of the legs are covered and one would be no cover. And then finally, consistency. And the way we get around consistency is protocols. So no matter who is feeding, it's all done the same. At Calves Don't Care, if it's a Sunday afternoon and there's no one else on farm, they want um, to be fed the same feed, the same temperature at the same time. And stress calves can lead to sick calves. So inconsistency is normally where you start to see problems. So that's just a brief overview of the five C's. And now I just want to touch on um, some calf feeding guidelines. So what is the cow's choice when it comes to um, milk replacer or milk intake? Beef calves, I uh, hope you agree, generally always look brilliant. Arguably some of the best looking calves can be beef calves at foot. And they will have ad lib milk and it'll always be fresh and warm. Beef calves um, can take 10 to 15 liters in a day. And that will generally not be more than one liter at a time. Um, whole milk is roughly 12.5% milk solids, so 125 grams in a litre, which means these calves can take up to 1.25 to 1.9 kilos of dry matter from milk solids a day. Um, so it, it's no surprise that they can grow at 1.3 to 1.5 kilos daily live weight gain. And you start to compare those to how we used to feed heifers with maybe 500 grams of milk replacer a day, you can start to see how our research and our way of feeding heifer calves needed to change. And that's where the enhanced feeding came in, which we'll touch on just in a second. Um, but as I was talking about before, about always making sure calves have milk, water, concentrate and forage available. The reason for that is rumen development. So you can see here, um, the size of the rumen when calves are offered milk only, it's quite small and there's not much development of the rumen. Um, for basically the more the more developed it is in the larger surface area, the more area they've got to digest nutrients. The second one is just milk and concentrate. So it is slightly larger, but you can see it's not that well defined. Um, the next one is just milk and hay, which again isn't uh, very well defined at all. And then the best one with the largest rumen and the most um, in-depth papillae and development is from milk, concentrate and forage. And this forage was through chop straw. So the standard plane of nutrition, um, the more traditional way of feeding would be 125 grams to make one litre. So that's adding, adding 875 ml of water and 125 grams of milk replacer. Uh, you'd be starting around four litres and gradually getting up to six litres by the start of week three. And then you'd be starting to wean them around six weeks once they're consuming at least one and a half kilos of concentrate for two days. And they'd be fully weaned by 10 weeks, but only when they're consuming 2.5 kilos of concentrate. So those would be the KPIs for the standard feeding. The new way of thinking with the enhanced plane um, is increasing volume and also um, concentration. So m most now for our heifers, we look to push for the enhanced feeding plane, which is 150 grams to 850 ml of water. So 15% concentration. And the reason why I've just pointed that out with the 850 ml of water is if you're adding 150 grams to a thousand liter, a thousand milliliters or a liter, that is a lower concentration. So if you're adding it to um, 1,000 mil, you're going to look at 165 grams. So do just read the back of your bag carefully when they're telling you how many grams to add to make up a litre. Um, so this one will start them on four to six litres. They'll be up to eight litres by the start of week three, but the weaning KPIs are the same. One and a half kilos of concentrate at least before we start weaning. Um, with a two through um, weaning period and then they're weaned by 10 weeks. 
So why are we bothered about enhanced feeding? Why should we be looking to feed this 150 grams per litre? What difference does it make? Um, enhanced feeding can exploit the genetic potential of the animal. So like what we were talking about with the queen bee, but you've only got a very small time frame to exploit that potential, which is known as metabolic programming. So we put a lot of money into good genetics, but we need to make sure that we uh, get the most out of that. So you can almost think of it as walking down a corridor. And once you've gone past the door, you can't turn back around behind you and open that door to unlock the potential. Once you're past that first 50, 60 days, that's it, it's gone. So in this study, um, they looked at a control feed and an enhanced feed of milk replacer, which is 150 grams per litre. And they got a higher average daily live weight gain, which was actually double that of the control group. And when they looked at organ development, you can start to see where this increase in milk yield com comes from. So the mammary gland was um, much, much larger in that enhanced group. But more interestingly, the parenchyma, which are the milk secreting cells, were again a lot higher. And what I was talking about it being early on, the first 50, 60 days, um, this is because that's when the organ development occurs in calves. So you can see here we've got 0 to 50, 50 to 100 and so on. But the most organ development is in these first 50 days. And following on from that, um, a meta-analysis of over 13, pages, 13 papers all showed a positive response with the enhanced feeding. And actually, when we averaged all of the data, it showed 3.5 gram, 3.5 litres per one gram over the 650 grams of daily live weight gain. So essentially what this is saying is if you improve your daily live weight gain from 750 to 850 grams per day, we're talking another 350 litres in the first lactation. So it's not insignificant numbers. And so I hope that makes sense on to why you might be hearing or seeing in the media and seeing in marketing why a lot of companies have moved to this 150 grams to make a litre. So moving on to the second half of the presentation now in terms of calf milk replacers, what are your options? What different types of milk replacers are out in the market? You've essentially got two. You've got a skim or you've got a whey. Skimmed uh, milk is a byproduct of the milk industry and casein is the main milk protein, which isn't readily digested in the small intestine. So we want a coagulation of milk proteins through enzymes, which form a clot or a nutrient, a little nutrient bullet, which is then slowly broken down and flows into the small intestine. So this is what we want to see, a functional uh, large clot. This would be an infunctional clot um, and something that could maybe be affecting the digestion of these products. So for this functional clot, you want at least 30% skim in your milk replacer. And if you're, if you're not sure of what percentage skim is in your milk replacer, a good indication is if it's first on the list. So if you're buying a skim milk and you want it for this reason, it needs to form a clot, it needs to be skim first on the list. Whey, on the other hand, is made of globular whey proteins and is readily digested and absorbed at the top of the small intestine. So there's no need um, for a clot for the whey product. So they are digested slightly differently. And whey powder is a byproduct of the cheese manufacture. So it can be a little bit confusing um, when whey, whey milk replacers don't follow the milk market. Um, because they're a byproduct of cheese manufacture, they follow the cheese markets. So whey powder, there are two different types of whey powder. You wouldn't know it because we don't have to declare it on a label, but there are different types which can start to um, suggest why maybe certain products are cheaper than others. So whey is um, the liquid that remains after cheese manufacture and it's then carefully dried down to produce whey powder. But the manufacturing process can affect, uh, affect which one. So you've got acid whey or sweet whey. 
acid whey is produced um, when manufacturing soft cheeses or strained dairy products, so things like cottage cheese. Um, it's sometimes referred to as sour whey. It can have a lower pH, and that lower pH of acid whey can sometimes cause the pH of the gut to drop, um, making it less easy for good bacteria to populate. And it has a high lactic acid content. And all that does is makes it harder to dry. So you can get lumps and inconsistency in the product. So not really ideal or something we're looking for in a calf milk placer. Sweet whey powder, on the other hand, is based on a rennet type system. So from hard cheeses, it's spray dried to provide a free flowing powder, but there are two different types of grades. So food grade is very consistent and it's the type that you get in your sports drinks. Um, feed grade is more granular and not quite as consistent. So essentially what we're looking for um, when we're looking at whey powder is for sweet food grade whey to be used. So how do you choose which product you want? How do you know if you want a skim or a whey? What are you currently feeding? If you're maybe on whole milk and wanting to start feeding a milk replacer, I would definitely suggest a skim because they're digested in the same way. Um, what are your morbidity and mortality rates? So what is your disease rates like? And what is your death rates like? Unfortunately, in the UK, the average mortality is still up at around 15%, which is quite high. Uh, a good unit would probably be um, put in the region of below five. So if you've got quite high deaths on farm or you're getting high disease problems, I would definitely always suggest a, a skim over a whey. These heifers cost a lot to raise, uh, between 1,200 and 1,500 pounds. We want to get her to the first, second, third, fourth lactation. And so if you can do that by paying a little bit more for a slightly more forgiving milk replacer, then that's something we would look to do. What are your objectives? Are you selling calves early at market? Um, a skim can give them a, a bit of a better bloom if you are. What are you currently achieving? Are you on a whey powder that you're feeding six litres a day at 150 grams and getting 900 grams of growth? Why would you consider paying more for a skin product if you're getting that kind of performance? How are you feeding your calves and what is your overall management like? Have you got the same person, same calf rearer, feeding your calves every day or near enough every day with very strict protocols? Um, do you need to be looking at improving your protocols to stay on the same milk replacer you've got? And there's no right or wrong answer. And I would always encourage you to look at quality over whether it's a whey or a skim. Um, so I prefer to feed a highly digestible whey powder over a skim that maybe was second, skim second on the list. I'm not going to get a functional clot and maybe a few other um, undigestible ingredients in it. For example, at home, we feed up to nine litres of a whey product, which is a 2420, uh, low mobility, low disease, low death rate. Heifer's calved down at 24 months of age, average 35 litres in the first lactation, but by the second, they're up keeping up with the rest of the herd at 41. So why would we look to pay 200, 250 pound more for a skin product with that performance? Um, focus on quality first, your current performance, and then where you want to take them. So in terms of the milk replacer label itself, most milk replacers are a mix of non-dairy and dairy proteins. Ideally, you want as large a portion of dairy protein as possible um, because the majority of non-dairy proteins aren't as well digested, particularly in the first few weeks of life. Um, signs of really high non-dairy proteins can include calves kicking their bellies. They basically just get bad uh, tummy upset because they can't digest what, what they're being fed. So the most common non-milk proteins would be soya-based milk proteins, pea proteins, or hydrolyzed wheat protein. So starting with soya, it's economically attractive. 
It's a moderate quality protein. It does have anti-nutritional factors and it's got a mismatched amino acid profile. So soya for grown dairy diets, everyone thinks great, you know, it, it can really benefit, it can increase milk yield, blah, blah, blah. But actually for milk replacers for young animals, it's not something we want to see on a ticket. Um, which can be a little bit of a shock when we talk about that on farm and um, but it isn't very digestible particularly for the first few weeks of age for these young calves another one would be pea protein which are highly digestible um, and a concentrated form of protein they've got no anti-neutral anti-nutritional factors but unfortunately it does have a sedimentation risk so if you're using a milk taxi mixing up quite a large amount at once and then feeding it out potentially you're at risk of getting that pea protein sedimenting at the bottom, a bit of a sludge, um, which is essentially wasted protein because it's not actually getting into the calf. Our best option on the market would be hydrolyzed wheat protein, um, which is highly digestible. It has no antinutrial factors, but it should be fortified with amino acids. And it must be hydrolyzed. And all that means is it's just broken some of the bonds to make it more digestible. Um, others you might have heard of is wheat flour, which um, has little nutritional value. Um, you see some things on certain labels like onions, grape pips. Again, um, not the best quality or the most digestible to a calf. Moving on to the oil content or the energy. Um, we look at the digestibility of the fatty acids that are included. So small chain fatty acids are really highly digestible and um, easily absorbed in the abomasum. Unfortunately, they don't really exist um, to add into milk replacers. So our best bet is a medium chain fatty acid, which is around 95% digestible. Um, and examples of those will be coconut and veg oil. And then your larger chain fatty acids are less digestible. They can be as low as 80% and they're harder to, to digest, especially in young calves. So those first three weeks of age, they really struggle to digest those longer chain fatty acids. And examples of those would be rape and soya. So for example, if we've got a long chain fatty acid and you're buying a milk replacer with 20% oil, that's 4% that's potentially lost straight away because it's not digestible. So energy is always a limiting factor in calf growth. So we want that portion to be as digestible as possible. Another thing that um, suppliers can do to help that process is to homogenate the fat globules. And essentially all that means is make them all a uniform small size. So if you look at them through a, a microscope, this would be what homogenized looks like, tiny particles that you can hardly even see. Um, but a blended fat that isn't homogenized, you can see you've got your big um, globules there. And signs of that in on farm, uh, of not have the, having the homogenized fat, would be poor mixing and emulsification, coating on buckets and feeding equipment, blocked pipes on automatic feeders, and you get um, a kind of sticky, cloggy muck on the calf's backside so a lot of them do get quite bare bums um, other things to look out for would be a really high mixing temperature on your milk replacer ticket so really a good quality milk replacer shouldn't need to be mixed over 45 degrees so that's also something else you can um, have a little look out for following the five c's and using a good calf milk replacer what else is there to it um, setting targets can be really helpful. Um, are you weighing or weigh banding calves? Are you recording their first insemination and checking the age at first calving? So not just the average, but concentrating on the outliers. Why are X, Y, Z over 24 months? Should they even be maintained within the herd when you get to a certain age? Um, I'll show some figures in a second, which might help to focus the importance on that on that decision on farm so does weight matter you've probably all heard the magic number of triple birth weight by three months of age but what happens after that so from weaning to first calving we then talk about maintenance growth 
and all of these percentages are based on a mature weight and we take a mature weight as being a third lactation cow so if we're wanting her to calve down by two years of age she needs to be mated by 13 to 15 months and a percentage mature weight we're looking for her to be at that stage is 55 to 60 percent and the reason why that weight is important is for her to reach sexual maturity and to start puberty in time to then be able to inseminate her to calve down get pregnant and calve down by two years of age so why are we bothered about their age um looking at some king's a costings the replacement a cost of um raising replacements is expensive and it accounts for 15 to 20 percent of expenses on farm we touched on the average cost of um, rearing a heifer earlier, but on King's Day's own figures, it's £1,500 to raise a heifer to the point of calving at 24 months. But if we get over that, if we go over 24 months of age, it can increase up to more than 30%. Um, do we know when she starts paying us back? Not until her third lactation. So we want her calving down and putting milk back in the tank and earning her way as soon as we possibly can. Um, and all this, all this graph shows is how age at first calving affects replacement herd size. Essentially, we are saying if she calves down at 24 months, we're, we're good on um, replacement rates, but actually the older she is over that, our replacement rates go up. So not only is she costing us more to rear over 24 months of first calving, she's also less likely to stay in the herd. So she's likely to give us less milk and less lactations because we're gonna to have to replace her sooner. So this actually ties back into our enhanced feeding and 150 grams. This is some livestock research um, and they've looked at the enhanced a group compared to a conventional group. So enhanced are 150 grams per litre and conventional are 125 grams per litre. Um, and this shows they reached an earlier age at first insemination. So it's no shock to hear that they also raged an earlier puberty rate, which is why we could get an earlier first insemination. Following on from that, we got a, an earlier first pregnancy from those earlier first inseminations. So we're very focused on milk feeding stages, but actually looking at the whole long game and the whole process can give us even more um, benefits. So in this instance, they got them pregnant 23 days sooner. On average, it depends where you look for figures of days open, but it costs between 450, uh, 250, sorry, to just over four pounds. Um, so in this instance, we estimated a £60 per heifer advantage to getting her pregnant those 23 days sooner. And that, that's on top of the things that we've already discussed. So extra milk in the first lactation, a higher survivability. So she's more likely to get to a second, third or fourth lactation um, uh, with a lower replacement rate and also cost us less to get her to that point. So that's all well and good, but how do we get there? Protocols and consistency, which is what I mentioned um, right at the start with the five C's, to ensure that everyone does everything the same and to the same standard. So calving, colostrum, calf ID, feeding and mixing the milk replacer and feeding it out, hygiene, you know, who cleans out the pens, who disinfects them? Are you boot dipping when you're going between adult cows to young cows? It can all make, um, to young heifers, it can all make such a big difference and health scoring as well. And it really is the whole package. We've spoken today about milk replacer, but it isn't a silver bullet. You need everyone working together on the farm, your nutrition, who you buy your milk replacer off and the vets. Um, it's a massive team effort and everyone working together, you're always going to get better results. Um, so just finally, I hope you've enjoyed what we've touched on today. It was quite brief and quick. I tried not to bore you with PowerPoint um, and too much information. But if you wanted to head over to our website, um, all, our, all our newsletters are on there, which give much more information and also technical news, um, which I touched on before about the heat stress for calves as well. 
So with that, thank you for listening. Um, you're more than welcome to contact any of us. Um, this is the list of all the Youngstock team's details. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself or send Beth a message. So I will leave it there and hand it over to Beth and see if we do have any questions. Has everyone been very quiet? Yeah, we've had no questions through yet. <laughs> okay. Whether that's my, just my Zoom um, capability. Uh, can I ask you a question? <laughs> yes. Um, I was just going to ask, like, what would be a spec of calf milk replacer that you would see ideally? Like, what would be your go-to spec? Um, our go-to spec would be a 2420. You've obviously got the UCM, which is 25, 22 and a half, and um, which also works very well on farm. But that they would be our, our go-to specs. And again, it's it's not saying that a different spec is wrong. Um, if they're good quality, I would always go for that and what's in the milk replacer first and then look at the spec. Yeah, any experience using any yeast products in calf milk replacers like hydrolyzed yeasts or you know yeah other? so a lot of mosses get used in yeast um uh, in milk replacers and um, which are essentially bees bee glucans so they help to um stop well not stop because they're not a medicated feed but they help to um use the own calf's immunity to stop certain pathogens attaching to the gut lining so yeah absolutely they can if they're authorized for calves and have calf research behind them yeah they can definitely um, be a benefit yeah thanks we have got one question um okay. what would be the most effective change to make first oh god um, <laughs> Yeah, that's it's for, without seeing the unit or maybe speaking to you first. That's probably difficult to um, pinpoint because if you walked on a farm and maybe they didn't have straw in racks, that would probably be, or maybe they didn't have water offered. You know, it, it depends. There's so many things that could be a standout on different units. Um, I think maybe like quite a good place is just looking at going through those five yeah the five and C's, doing like your own sort of audit and see right what what are you doing now what should we be doing and then get that first and then see yeah see what what's what's like the most limiting or if that makes sense yeah but without seeing the unit it probably is difficult to what, what's Abby? What's some of the common ones you'd see in Beth? What were some of the common ones? Would you say perhaps hygiene? Uh, um, um, colostrum, colostrum, colostrum would honestly massive. Yeah, be massive, and your blood tests really are cheap, and um, through your vets, they're less than ten pounds. Um, so to do that, to check if you can get correct passive immunity, you are a well way on the right track. Um, so yeah, it all starts with colostrum. I could do a whole presentation on colostrum, but I probably really would bore you then. <laughs> We've had a thanks and a thumbs up from the people who just asked that one. Um, and then we've got another one. This one's another um, mind. But I think it may be a bit... Oh, bit... Beth, you've gone rosy. <laughs> oh, no. Hang on. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that better. Right, we've got another one. Um, this one is to do with breeding and just sort of what impact does breeding have? Um, I think that's another. Sorry, you weren't really robot. <laughs> uh, what impact does breeding? Breeding have? is in genetics. I would have thought so. Um, yeah, yeah. breeding is uh, breeding with genetics. Obviously, if you can start with it, it's kind of where it all starts, doesn't it? If you can start with good genetics, then it's exploiting that genetic potential then. Um, if you're starting with poor genetics, you've maybe got, no matter how good you do with the rearing, there is always going to be that ceiling provided with the genetics. If that answers, if I've got the right gist of that question. Thanks. think so. 
if we got any more questions. Oh, we've had a thumbs up. <laughs> well, that was a good discussion. Thanks, everyone. I thought maybe you'd fallen asleep or switched the football on or something for a minute then. <laughs> I think unless anyone's got any more, um, obviously our details are, are on there. So if you wanted a, a chat separate to this, just feel free to give one of us uh, a call or an email. I'll make sure Lizzie gets the presentation PDF as well. So you can send that out. And I believe it's going to go out on YouTube. So if you want to rewatch any of it. Um, well, thank you for your time. It is appreciated. Well, yeah, just to um, thank Beth and Abby um, for their time this evening and also the time in terms of putting the presentation together beforehand. I think it's been really informative and there's been some good questions and it's great that other members will be able to access it from um, you know, YouTube and those areas. And please do contact the team if you've got any further questions or need some information. But thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, everyone.